for all coming down on this very special Sunday. We are live from Books and Books in Coral Gables, Florida, so a note to our internet audience watching at home. If you're inter interested in today's book, we'll ship it to wherever you are in the U.S. free of charge. Just call the number on your screen. This afternoon, Books and Books is very happy to present Mr. Michael Sala and Mr. Mitch Weiss and their new book, The Yankee Comandante, The Untold Story of Courage, Passion, and One American's Fight to Liberate Cuba. Mr. Sala and Mr. Weiss are co-winners of the 2004 Pulitzer Prize for Investigative Reporting. They are also the co-authors of the previous book, Tiger Force, A True Story of Men and War. In this book, they bring us the incredible story of El Yankee Comandante, William Morgan, drawing on declassified FBI, CIA, and Army intelligence records, as well as on the diaries of Morgan's widow, Olga. Mr. Sala and Mr. Weiss skillfully reveal the inner workings of the Cuban Revolution while detailing the love story of a rebel nurse and an American street hero who left their mark on history. Please give a very warm welcome to Mr. Michael Sala and Mr. Mitch Weiss. Um, thank you for coming out today. We uh, really appreciate it. Um, this story for both of us has been a, a journey. Um, we are career journalists. We've been in journalism uh, for more years than we even probably want to say. But for me, and I know I'm, I'm probably uh, speaking for Mitch as well, this um, is the, the, the greatest story I've ever worked on um, for a lot of different reasons. Uh, and we've both worked on a lot of very incredible um, national stories, international stories. I, there, there's not one that comes close to this for a lot of different reasons. Um, for us, I think this became a, a, a kind of a detective thriller. Um, we never heard of William Morgan uh, until about 12 years ago. We had a visit. We were both reporters at the Toledo Blade in Ohio. We had a visit from a historian from Harvard, Aaron Shetterly, uh, who was doing research. And they called, my editors called me in the office, and, and they said, have you ever heard of, a, of a, a man named William Alexander Morgan? And I thought I knew everything about Toledo's history, its, its history with... Um, uh, prohibition and organized crime and and its war history it's it's uh, corporate history but I didn't know anything about William Morgan and when our historian left he said one thing I think his widow is living in Toledo so I went immediately I went to our newspaper morgue our library and I pulled out a file of old yellowed newspaper clippings probably as thick as a phone book of William Morgan and I started going through these stories and he had been written up in the New York Times, Time Magazine, Look Magazine, uh, there was a big photo spread in Look. I thought, good Lord, somewhere along the line he slipped through the cracks of history and, and, we, and we, what we eventually started to be able to find more and more of was his role in, in, in not just the Cuban Revolution but the Cold War during this period was so unique. And so I immediately started just researching as much as I could. Mitch was an editor then at the, uh, at the Toledo Blade and I talked to him, he had said, just keep going, go to the courthouse. I wanted to go through marriage records just to see if maybe this widow had remarried. And it turns out here was a woman named Olga Rodriguez who had married in the 1980s and here was an address, and I started going through databases. And on a cold, windstruck day, and I didn't bother to call anyone, I showed up at this, this town home in Toledo. Uh, I remember it was snowing out, and I went to the door and I knocked it. And this, this woman came to the door, and she opened it up, and she goes, can I help you? In, in a bit of broken English, I says, you, you're Olga, right? And she says, yes. And I said, Olga Morgan and she kind of said yes like that and I wanted to talk to her but she, 
She wanted anything to do with me at the time. She did not. She wanted me out of there. <laughs> she didn't know who I was and why I was there. And she said something in Spanish to her granddaughter. And, and the next thing I know, I, I, all I could do was barely get my card, my business card through the door, and it was closed. And it took several days, and eventually I got this call from, from Olga Maria Rodriguez Farina, and there she was. And she says, you can come and visit me, uh, uh, but it will be a short visit. So I did go back to her house, and she let me come in, and she brought out some material from these scrapbooks, showing this one of these is this incredible picture of her and her husband in the mountains of the Escambra in 1958, uh, July of 1958. And, it, it, you know, she gave me an hour. She told me a bit of her story. By then I had done enough research, and she let me come back a little bit more every day. I believe by the third day I was able to turn on the tape recorder and just listen to this amazing story of this woman and her husband in the mountains during the revolution and what happened after. And the characters of Fidel Castro, Che Guevara, Rafael Trujillo, all these people from the Cold War, and what an amazing um, uh, a whole series of individuals surrounding her and her husband during this very historic period. And I realized, what, a, what an amazing story. And she only wanted two things. She wanted her husband's citizenship. And there's probably the only reason she was even <laughs> bothering to talk to me at the time. She wanted her husband's citizenship restored, and she wanted his remains brought back to America for reburial. And so... I, you know, I said, if these are the things you want me to impart in this story, that's not a problem. But give me the time to be able to spend time with you and research it. And, and we did. And we spent time. And then I came to Miami and I, and I was able to, I was introduced to several people, including um, Teresa Del Pino and her daughter, who were the children and wife of Jesus Carrera, who was another uh, comandante. Um, in the mountains with William Morgan and and then by little by little we started learning more and more about this individual you know I must tell you at first it was difficult to write this story and if we had stopped before he went to Cuba it would have been very difficult yeah. talk a little bit about that Mitch and well it, it would have been difficult because one of the things you do as an investigative reporter or you're writing a book is you try to dig into somebody's background to see who they were. You look at the events that shaped their lives. And William Morgan, uh, you know, he grew up in Toledo. Um, his father, you know, uh, worked for, you know, Toledo Edison. He was, uh, you, you know, this, this ran, you know, had the books, you know, was, was an accountant. His mom was a homemaker. But throughout his, his, his early life, this was, a, this was a guy who constantly got in trouble. He was... He was a dreamer, the kind of guy who would sit in the back of the movie theaters and, and watch action movies with Errol Flynn and dream that one day that he would be doing the same thing. He didn't do very well in school. He uh, you know, dropped out. He ran away from home. He um, got into you know, some scrapes with the law. And one day um, his, he called his parents from Arizona and said, I've enlisted in the Army. And his mother was really worried at that point because she knew this was a kid who didn't adjust well to discipline. And she could see you know, trouble ahead for him because <coughs> this was a guy who just wasn't good with authority. And sure enough, he went into the army and um, you know, he, he was stationed in Japan and he went AWOL after a couple of months. And, um, you know, he ended up, you know, spending a couple of years in jail for, for going AWOL. But on the other hand, and, and then I'll let Mike take it over from this point, this was a guy with a bigger-than-life personality. He was always, when he walked into the room, people gravitated towards him because of his charisma. And there was one example in the book that, that I love. Here he is, he's just, you know, an 18-year-old kid, and he's on a train, you know, going from Ohio to um, to military base on the West Coast. Well, as he gets on the train in Chicago, there's a woman who gets on board with him, and she's engaged to somebody else, and she's working in Washington. 
And by the time that train arrives in Reno, they're jumping off the train to get married. <laughs> and so and that just doesn't happen by chance. That happens when you have that larger than life personality. And, and that was, you know, some of the things we wrestled with. On one hand, you know, he has that career, but on the other hand, you can't ignore his past either. And that's what at times made him a difficult character. Yeah, I, yeah. I think you also, it's really good. And I think you also find that in time, he took these different parts of himself and they all seem to come in, come in place in one place. And that is, that is Cuba. Before we get there, he, um, he ends up coming down to, uh, he gets out of prison. It's difficult to find a job. You know, being dishonorably discharged in the 1950s is, you know, post-war America and post-World War II. It's, it's not a great uh, rap on your record to get jobs and things like that. And William ends up coming down to Florida, joining the circus, became a fire eater of all things. He's the fire eater in the circus. He meets a woman who's the snake charmer. Uh, this could only happen in his life. They get married in Miami. He ends up working at a place called the Bowery. It was a comedy nightclub in downtown Miami. And um, the, he, he ends up getting these little side jobs, running guns, down to the Keys, to these young men coming in offshore in the middle of the night, young Cuban men and boys, picking up guns to take to Cuba. A revolution is in the in the is in the running here, and he starts to talk to them about their stories. Sometimes they start gravitating and coming into the Bowery. One man was a name like Roger Roger Rodriguez, and he was a medical student, and they became close. And he starts talking to William about William says, "Why don't you just practice medicine here? You could have everything." You no, I'm going back to my country to fight for freedom, and it seemed like all the young men he met. They could have been doing anything at that point in time, but they were going back with their guns to fight in a revolution. And he's intrigued with this notion. In the meantime, his own marriage is unraveling. So he goes back to Ohio to try to work things out with his wife. They have a couple small children by then, but he never lost sight of those, those young boys that he saw coming in the boats into the dry, coming in off the dry Tortugas into the Keys to pick up guns. And eventually in time, things start to unravel up north. He is, a well, he is a street hero to a lot of people. They used to call him Two Gun Morgan because he carried two guns. He started working for the local outfit. He was an enforcer. But that wasn't a satisfying life for him, and he knew it. And he knew his marriage wasn't going to last. And he had one chance, and he knew it. And in the back of his mind, <laughs> he wanted to go back. He had tried several times to get back in the Army. William Morgan still had ideals. He was inherently a very good person, and he wanted to go back into the service. He wanted to prove himself as an Army serviceman again. And again and again, from the letters that we found, you could tell it was on his heart that, he, that he had, his life was incomplete until he could go back and prove that he wasn't that young, imp impetuous little 18-year-old anymore, that he was growing. But they wouldn't let him back in. So he eventually says goodbye to his mother, kisses his wife and kids goodbye, he says, I have to do this. I know you don't understand why. I know you'll probably never understand why, but I am going to Miami. I'm going to Havana. I'm going to fight with these young guys that I was meeting all those years. And so he ends up coming down to Miami, walking around the block yeah. sometime, and then eventually... He ends up at a place called the Paula Restaurant. And um, the Paula Restaurant at a time was kind of a recruiting station. It was, it was a place that all the revolutionaries would come to and they would make plans about going back to, to Cuba. At the time, the Paula restaurant was really helping the 26th of July movement, which was, which was Castro's guerrilla group. And uh, Morgan, he comes down. You have to realize at this point in his life, he has $20 in his pocket. Um, he basically is wearing the clothes on his back. This is the lowest point in his life. He's about 28 years old. Everybody he grew up with in Toledo in this neighborhood has moved on. They're successful. You know, Toledo at the time had a number of Fortune 500 companies, and all his friends are working for these companies. And he's Two Gun Morgan walking on the streets. And so he comes down to Miami with an idea in his head that somehow, some way, he's going to join the Cuban Revolution. And since he knows that the Paula restaurant is kind of the epicenter for this, 
he decides this is where he's just going to walk in. He doesn't know a soul. And he's going to try somehow to get from the Paula restaurant to Havana. And so he circles the blocks a few times, and then he walks in. And he's out of place. I mean, he's, you know, this six foot tall, strapping block. And everybody in there speaks Spanish, and everybody who goes in is really going there for, for one reason. It's, you know, the secret door in the back. And he sits down at a table. And Paula, who's the owner, tells two of the kids who are there, uh, Antonio Chow and Amundo Amato, to go over and see what this, this gringo wants. Because they thought that maybe he was either an undercover cop or he was with the FBI. Because they're running weapons and they want to, this guy just shows up out of nowhere. Miami had become kind of a collision course of two worlds then. It's the swanky postcard image of cruise ships and hotels. And then the other, it's a staging ground for, for a revolution. And they're collecting guns, they're collecting cash, and they're trying to raise the cause. And they're even getting out there doing demonstrations. And the CIA is somewhere in the middle of all this. So um, they, um, they, they, they both come over to Morgan and they're both told by Jose Paula, get rid of this guy. <laughs> we're, we're about to have a meeting here and we don't know who he is. And Morgan kind of realizes that. So he, but he doesn't want to fight, and, but he also doesn't want to leave because this is his only ticket. This is his ticket over to Havana. So he sits there and he's talking to the, uh, these young men and they're talking to him and he starts engaging with them. And they can speak broken English. Both of them had dropped out of John F. Kennedy Jr. High School. They had, their families had both moved them here to get them out of trouble and get them out of Havana. Tony Chow had barely made it out of Havana. If not for the, the mercy of a, a local police officer, uh, Chow would have probably been arrested. So they get him out. Both these guys are surrounding Morgan right now. And Morgan realizes, I got to think of something fast. So he tells them that he wants to avenge the death of a friend. Now, it's not all 100% what was going on then, but he convinced them both that he meant it from the heart, that he really wanted to join their cause, that he had been in the military, he knew how to strap on and fire an M1, he knew how to bring grenades. William Morgan was tough. He knew karate, he knew he could box very well, he was great with his hands and his feet. And these were young kids, and the thing that struck him was Tony Chow. He looks at this young boy, he's got blonde hair, blue eyes, Morgan's blonde hair, blue eyes. He sees Chow's passion in his heart and he realizes, that's what I was when I was 16. That's what I want to be. This is, and that kid really inspired him. And Morgan says, I have to go with you. I'm going with you over to Havana. And eventually the, both these guys relent, but they tell him, look, we can get you there. The question is whether they're going to accept you in the, in the, in the, in the rebel fort, in the rebel, in the rebel units. Um, and so they all fly over there. In fact, uh, and Mudo Amato had been saving uh, a lot of money. He lo loaned Morgan the money to fly. They all fly over there together. And um, they get there and they find out the safe house they're at is under watch by the SIM, by, the, by Batista's secret police. And so they realize that something's really amiss here. Morgan takes a list of all the people he was supposed to call when he gets here. They gave him a bunch of numbers. And as he's going to the phone booth, he runs into Roger Rodriguez, of all people, the, the medical student he knew from a Miami. And Roger says, well, then they hug, and William, I can't believe you're here. And he says, what are you here for? He says, I want to go fight with you in the revolution. He goes, William, you got to go back. You can't be here. You don't even speak Spanish. You're not part of He goes, I'm not leaving. I got $20 in my pocket. I'm not leaving. He's let me see the list you have. So William shows him the list. He says, these are all Batista operatives. He goes, I cannot let you go with anything. And he tears it up. He says, there's another unit. They're fighting in the Central Mountains. It's the second front, Segunda Frente. He goes, that's the unit I think that could use your help. If they'll take you, let me work on it. And after a couple days, Roger showed up at the house with another driver, and they drove William Morgan into the mountains. Morgan gets there, and it wasn't a warm welcome. By the time he meets the members of the Second Front, they're very suspicious of him. It's Eloy Gutierrez Manoyo who comes out and greets him and says, what are you doing here? Why are you here? And Morgan tries to tell him the same story about avenging the life of a friend. Manoyo doesn't know if it's true or not, but he could see there was something in Morgan that was real. 
and, 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 and then it was Lazaro Artola that says, look, let's run him up and down the hills. If he can survive our training, then he can survive and he can stay here. Otherwise, the Yankee will go home. So they did that. They, they oh, they did. And, and again, you go back to you know, Morgan. He shows up in Havana with that white suit. Okay, so now he's in the middle of the Escambray Mountains in a white suit. And they're running him up and down the mountains. Plus, he's overweight. So now, you know, he has this white suit on. He's sweating through his shirt. Every day they're running him up and down the mountains. He just has his shoes on. And finally, after about, what was it, a week of yeah. just constant, you know, just testing him, he says, I am not a mule. He turns around and he snaps at them. And I, I think of the moment, I don't know if anyone's ever seen the movie, you know, An Officer and a Gentleman, where, you know, the, the, Louis Gossett Jr. is working him really hard, you know, Richard, Richard Gere. Gere. And he says, aren't you going to quit? And he goes, I have nowhere to go. And so when we were right, it's almost like we were thinking of that, you know, for a moment because here's a guy, he has nowhere really to go. He can go back to the United States, but to what? So he pushes himself. He's not going to let them beat him, even though he's wearing that white shirt and it's soaked and it's dirty. And when he snaps and says, I'm not a mule, at that point they said, okay, maybe we'll let up on him. Maybe. And um, then when they started doing some of the training, you know, they would have him fire a rifle and um, they saw that instantly he was the best shot. And the second front at that time was essentially a ragtag group of idealistic students who made it up. Mo you know, they were... 19, 20 year old, some of them were farmers. So it was a small group that really didn't have that experience. And Manoyo looked at Morgan and saw the way he could shoot, saw the way he could throw a knife, um, believed that indeed he was a really good soldier and that, you know, he could be real useful in training the group to fight against, you know, Batista's soldiers. And, and of course, you know, his first um, uh, attempt, they finally do allow him the first time he's issued fatigues a gun, he had had that experience since he was in the army. He's feeling like he's getting closer to what his goal was, was his, his own redemption in many ways. And um, it didn't start out really great. He's on guard duty. They, he sees a unit, a smaller unit of Batista's soldiers coming down a, a deer trail. He goes back to Manoy and says, they're here, they're coming. So Manoy talks to everyone in Spanish and tells them, don't fire. We want to take them as we want to take them as, as as prisoners. We want their rifles. We want their weapons. And so he says, "Don't fire." Well, William gets up there, and what does he do? He fires. And of course, he didn't speak Spanish. He blew the cover. All of a sudden, they did shoot a couple of them, but the other ones were able to get away. And Manoya realized at that point, my God, they're going to be back here soon. And Manoya, at this point, their unit is not large. There's only a few really experienced. Um, um, rebels at that point with the unit and so now they got to set up an ambush because he knows the soldiers are going to be coming back in far greater numbers and they do um and, and of course there was a, a there were a moment when manoyo goes to morgan and screams i told you not to fire and he realizes this guy can't speak spanish so <laughs> how's he ever going to know and so um eventually they got to a point when when the soldiers finally get there they had Jesus Carrera in a, in a check, uh, check machine gun. They had one wonderful weapon. It was a check machine gun. It could spit out 650 rounds in a minute. And Jesus was good. He was very good. And they set him up on the high ground. They set him up. And the one thing that Manoyo started to understand, it was guerrilla warfare. This is before Vietnam. Use the land to your advantage. Use the terrain to your advantage. The soldiers had never really fought in the wilds. They had never fought in the mountains. So they were going to be at an automatic disadvantage. So they saw him coming, and Jesus opened up fire. They all opened up fire. And one thing they noticed about Morgan, he wouldn't retreat. He would just get up there. And at this point, he had an M1. It was before he had the Sten, the British Sten. And he would just keep going forward. And they thought, this guy's crazy. And he wouldn't retreat. He wouldn't lay down. And so... Um, they were able to get the best of the unit. The Batista soldiers had to retreat. There were several of them that had been killed during that particular skirmish. And the one thing the peasants remembered was the, 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 the sight of these horses coming down the, the, the path with the bodies of soldiers on the back, Batista soldiers on the backs of all these horses. And that's when they realized, wow, these guys, the second front, 
who had been humiliated, by the way, I should have said, at Christmas time, before then, before Morgan showed up, they had had several of them wiped out in a battle near Finca Diana. And so this was almost the, the second version of that, except it was reversed. And now it was the second front that came out, the victors. And I remember Roger Redondo saying, he still remembers the stories from the peasants of the seven-foot-tall Barbudos, you know, <laughs> as legend has it and as, as things turn out. But that skirmish turned out to be a wonderful recruiting tool for the second front. But I, by then, many of the Guajara and everyone were showing up with their old shotguns and their pitchforks and everything, wanting to fight in this revolution and believing in these young guys that they didn't believe in before. They, they thought it was going to be a disaster for them. But there was also a problem. Yeah, they knew that Batista's soldiers were going to come back, you know, in force. Um, and so Manoyo made the decision, we are going to, we have to leave this and we're going to, you know, basically go through, you know, the mountains until we find a new safe place, a new base. And, um, but it was, it was arduous. I mean, they had to climb the mountains, the terrain was rough, and they had to march from, you know, that area of Finca Diana all the way up to this other area. And it took them about 10 days to do it. And the guys were, you know, struggling to make it. You know, they're carrying whatever equipment they had. And for Morgan, this was really a defining moment, I think, for him because he was, he was pretty sick at the time. He was di dehydrated. He, you know, essentially had diarrhea and he just, you know, from eating, you know, not getting used to really the terrain. He was drinking, you know, having too many coconuts. The point is, is that he was really sick. And at one point during that march, he sits down and tells Manoyo, I can't go on anymore. He's with Romero That's Lorenzo. That's right. right. And, and he's with Romero R Lorenzo, and who basically had a broken foot. And so Lorenzo sits down, and Morgan sits down with him. And uh, Manoyo comes over to him and says, I can't leave you here. And Morgan says, well, I, I can't go on. I, you know, I'm, I'm really sick. I can't go on. And Manoyo looked at him and said, if you don't go on, I'm going to have to kill you. And so at that point, Morgan had this choice. He could sit there and maybe call Manoyo on his bluff or really dig deep and find his strength and actually move on. And so Morgan got up slowly and then he did something that all the um, soldiers would remember. He took a rope and he tied it around his waist and, and around Romero's waist and they both got up and not only did he make it, but he also carried Romero with him for the next couple of days until they made it to another camp. And, and, and uh, to, to this day, Romero uh, doesn't, he will never forget that. He said he saved my life. He basically saved his life. And it wasn't lost on the other rebels that he was with. When they saw him there, they realized he's with us. He's part of us now. It took them a long time. You have to understand, even among the second front, there was a I want to see a lot of anti-Americanism. There wasn't. But there wasn't a lot of love for the fact that Americans were supplying Batista with all these weapons and B-52 bombers and everything else. So that wasn't lost on those young men. And here was Morgan becoming one of them. And, and, and through a series of battles, Charco Azul, um, Café de Laura, um, the, 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 there was another one at, at La Diana, and others... They were able to eventually, it was the second front that, that moved out. Many of the soldiers, most of them, even the 11th Battalion, uh, led by uh, Colonel um, Angel uh, Mosquera Sanchez, um, or Sanchez Mosquera, they were able to pull them out and get them out of the upper highlands so that they stayed pretty much in the lowlands by then. That was the second front. One of the things we ran into when we were writing this book was that history gets rewritten. And I don't want to sound like a cliche here, but Castro did indeed rewrite history and try to write the Second Front out of their military, the significance of what they did in their military history. One of the things we really wanted to accomplish was in this was to give them their due. And not to overdo it. We're journalists. We have to do this right. But by doing it right, it also meant giving them the credit that they deserved for not for them moving the moving the soldiers out of the mountains and, and trust me they wouldn't go up there anymore after those battles especially with people like jesus carrera uh, lazaro artola um and manoyo and morgan 
They didn't want to mess with those guys anymore up there. They knew that there was a formidable unit. They're up to 400, almost 400 soldiers at this point, and nobody worked the mountains and the terrain better than they did. For all the controversy surrounding Manoyo, give him credit. He was a great, great warrior when he was in the mountains. He really was. Forget everything that happened after that. Remember what he did then, because you give credit where credit's due. He was amazing. And they were able to blow them all out so that when Che Guevara finally does that great sweep across the Central Highlands and the Escambray, it was so much easier. When he goes into Santa Clara, it, wasn't, it was difficult when he finally gets to there. But up until then, he had very little resistance. That's because of the Second Front. That's because people like, and, and I must tell you, there was a dust-up between them. Che Guevara came into the Escambray to basically, from the Sierra Maestra, to take over. And unfortunately, he ran into Comandante Jesus Carrera, who put it, who's put his foot down and says, you will not come in here. This is not your territory. This is our territory. The blood of the Second Front is seeping into the soil here, not yours. We're much closer to Havana than you are. You're way on the other end of the island, okay? Stay there. It didn't work out. So at the end of the day, there's a real civil war emerging between these units. They don't like each other. They don't like each other at all. But they realize they have to set aside their differences to fight a common, a common enemy who's Fulgencia Batista. So eventually, the revolution is won. And, and we, give che, che, uh, we give Che Guevara his credit for the Battle of Santa Clara and, and Camilo Sinfuegos and others. But, but give it its due. The Second Front had already blown the mountains out by the time they came across in their final sweep. And so someday, hopefully, as part of this history, more history will be written on that and what they were able to accomplish. By the time they all end up in Havana, the Second Front is pretty much left out. It's not a pretty picture for them. There's a lot of tension. Um, right. You know, you have to go back and look at the 26th of July movement. They were really... The, the international face of the revolution. Uh, Herbert Matthews goes into the uh, jungles and uh, in the Sierra Maestra and conducts Times. for the New York Times and conducts this lengthy interview with Castro. And it was really Castro who had all the, all the publicity, right? At Castro, no one even knew who Che Guevara was. Or Rob, it was all about Castro. And in fact, you know, going back to one point, Morgan was so angry that they were being overlooked. He even writes a letter when he's up in the mountains to try to get to the New York Times saying, this is why I'm here, this is why I'm fighting with, with, this, with this unit. And um, it is eventually you know, published by the New York Times and that's when the world knows that there is the second front and they're just as formidable as the 26th of July movement. But now you're in Havana and it's you know, Batista leaves New Year's Day on 1959. And now you have you know, Castro, he's gonna make his triumphant you know, march into Havana, he's still kind of on the outskirts. And Manoyo recognizes that they're gonna you know, get a lot of credit and that they really need to have some of their men in Havana to help maintain order. And so he puts you know, Morgan in, in, as, as mayor, mayor of San Fuegos and Manoyo goes into you know, Havana. But you can already see the tension start you know, really developing between the two sides over who's gonna control Cuba. And the one thing about that you have to understand is that the um, Manoyo did really the yeoman's work. He goes and they're on the street level trying to keep order because there's all hell is breaking loose in Havana. People are getting killed and, and, and they were trying to basically keep order. William Morgan and Olga by then, and, and please let's not forget, <laughs> William meets this <laughs> wonderful woman in the mountains named Olga, <laughs> and Olga had to escape. People have to understand that she had to escape from Santa Clara. She was president of her student government at the Normal Teachers College. She had risen up in her own way to become a leader among the students. Olga's own journey to the mountains was to protect herself. She had had, she had, she had did school walkouts, they had did lockouts at school, she had challenged the authority to a point where Batista's secret police were looking for her. They went to her house, they, they beat her brother, they did things to her, they went in and they ransacked the mother and father's house. They, were, they, they had pictures of Olga and they're out there looking for her the, the entire time. 
And it was a very difficult period in her life. She was raised in a wonderful, loving family. They didn't have a lot. They struggled. And by the time she reaches her young adulthood, she understood that there should be a far greater translation of the wealth. Why is Batista living in the lap of luxury in Havana with all these casinos and mobsters and everything else, and the people out here are struggling so much? Shouldn't there be greater justice and greater equality for everyone? And Olga stood up for her ideals. She was inspired by the characters of Jose Marti and others. And she, she ends up becoming one of Bati on the bad list for Batista's secret police, the Sim, and they're out looking for her. And she is eventually, she says, I'm going to go to the mountains. And I'm going to join them. And her, some of her fellow students are, you can't, that's crazy. Okay? You can't go up there. And she goes, I'm going. And they had to find a way for her, and she does get there in a very treacherous journey and is almost caught several times. She's on the back of horses. She's walking. Her feet are blistered. Yeah. They're, they're cracked. They're bleeding. And she finally arrives in the camp. And um, Manoyo accepted her as the first rebel female in the second front. And she distinguished herself by that. And... During the course of that, she starts to meet. She meets Armando Flaites. Armando's from Santa Clara. They know people. She meets the others, and then she meets the man named Morgan. And she looks at him, and she looks up at him, and it was done. By then, he looks at her, she looks at him, their eyes melt, and as quickly as that happens, they separate, and Olga looks over her shoulder, and Morgan's looking over his shoulder, realizing at some point they're going to see each other. And that happened not long after. Olga is staying in a farmhouse in the mountains, and Chris Manoia was making sure that she stayed in a farmhouse, <laughs> not in the camp with everyone else. But she walks outside, it's at night, and it, here's a, a, a classic Morgan, I'll let you tell the story. Well, a classic Morgan, she hears somebody whistle, uh, you know, the, the, he, was, he was on a white horse coming up to the farmhouse, and he's whistling this song that she doesn't know. It's it's the theme from Bridge Over the River Kwai. I mean, you know, he has one, of the, you know, he, and, and he's mo going up there, and, you know, he looks handsome. He's in his uniform, and it's nice and neat, and he has his beard. And, you know, Morgan was a pretty good-looking, strapping guy. And he goes up there just to, just to talk to her. And Olga was, you know, they, there were people watching Olga to make sure, kind of chaperoning in a way. And they go outside, and, and they, just, they just start to talk. And... You know, she asks him a little bit about him, his life and everything. And, and he doesn't really say much, but she knows that she's heard the stories about William Morgan. You know, the, the Americano, the one who's in battle and, uh, you know, is fighting so hard to free, you know, Cuba from this, from this dictator. Something about that. He was a romantic guy. Uh, she's, she's, she, and she, he would show up some, after that he would show up with a parrot he had a wild parrot and a bouquet of wild roses and put them and gave them to her as a present in the mountains in the middle of the war in the middle of the war you know and she keep, he keeps trying to talk to her about romance she says Comandante we are in a revolution she has to remind him several times they are in a revolution and eventually at one point the parrot Olga finds the parrot died and she's devastated because Morgan keeps going off. He comes into camp, then he leaves. He comes into camp, and she's like a yo-yo going up and down. And he's, quite frankly, they're both romantically inclined, but they have not yet really talked about it. And finally, when her parrot dies, Olga's devastated, and she walks out into the woods, and she keeps walking and walking and walking and doesn't stop until she's lost. William comes back to the camp. This is Nuevo Mundo. And um, the... And... and, and he says, where's Olga? And they, they, they tell him that the, the parrot died. And Olga says, oh, my God. Because he realizes they find Olga. She's dead. And so he gets on. They get, they get an entire posse. They go out into the, into the woods. They follow the trail. Eventually, he sees Olga sleeping by the side of a creek. And he walks up to her, and they don't care. And there's that big, long, romantic you know, kiss in front of everyone, in front of everyone. And at that point in time, it was together. They knew that this was going to be the real deal. Another point later when the, the bombers, they're walking together, they want to be alone, they're near the edge of the woods, 
the bombers, the, the two uh, fighter planes come over and they start, when the soldiers started keeping down and not going into the mountains, it didn't stop Batista from sending the air power over there to keep doing strikes. And so he starts blowing out the area around there and Olga and Morgan, Olga, Morgan jumps, they could see the, 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 the gun, the gun, the, 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 the guns were coming down from the, from the planes. And so he rolls on top of Olga, they roll up to her, to the side of a boulder and he holds her and there's Olga and Morgan and they're holding each other in time. And I think if it was after that moment, and please understand, Olga remembered that she wrote her memoir in 1982 in great detail. When she arrived here at the Mario Boat Lift, she writes these things in intricate detail and everything. She remembered it very well then. Doesn't remember quite as much now, but she did then. And so it became wonderful. And so she ends up, um, they both realized, you know what? We may not even survive this thing. We may never, but let's pledge our love to each other. And they found a, mar a mountain farmhouse and a, and a farmer by the name of Hernandez who agreed with two witnesses to marry them. And they were married in November of 1958 in the mountains, just before the final push and before the end, and they became together. So, so they, so they're, they're, they're married, and at some, so by the time Havana comes around, there's great tensions. Morgan gets called out of Sinfuegos. They're in Havana. They, Morgan sees one opportunity to actually help the second front. His biggest issue now is making sure his his he was called his boys were protected. Part of the problem was Che Guevara tried to strip the second front of the ranks and eliminate the second front. They wouldn't have anything of it. There were there were serious showdowns. One occurred at La Cabana between Jesus Carrera and 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 uh, Che Guevara, and they had to separate them. And they knew this is bad blood. The bad blood continued well after the mountains and continued into Havana. But the second front was at a disadvantage because. The, the 26th of July was in control. They had control of all the police stations. They had control of all the major media. Castro at that point had, had, had anointed himself prime minister. So there wasn't much the Second Front could do but then but to, but then to try to protect themselves at that point. And so one night Morgan gets a visit by a guy named Fred Nelson. Yeah, and Fred Nelson, at this point, the Second Front is set up, you know, Morgan set up at the Capri Hotel. And the Capri Hotel was, you know, this grand casino. You have to remember Havana before the revolution. I mean, the mob had set up all these big, you know, glitzy hotels, and the Capri was one of them. And um, so they had set up shop there. And um, no one really knew about Castro, where he stood as far as the casinos, and people were always these shady underworld characters, and other characters would always come in and try to talk. Hey, do you know Castro? Can you know what he's going to... And so one night, Fred Nelson shows up at the, um, at the hotel, and he has to talk to Morgan. And um, they have a, Morgan comes down, and they have a meeting. And he, he tells Morgan uh, that he wants to know if he would be willing to kill Castro. For a million dollars. For a million dollars. And at that point, Morgan didn't know what to do. He knew that he wasn't going to do that. <laughs> because no one knew you know, where Castro stood as far as, you know, was, was he a commie? There were some rumblings because people knew that Che had you know, kind of a left you know, communist leaning, Raul the same way. But Castro was assuring everyone, especially the international community, that no, he really wasn't a communist. So at that point, Morgan was, was, was in a conundrum. What does he do about this offer, the $1 million to, to kill Castro? He goes and he talks to Manoyo and the others about it, and Pedro Diaz Lanz is there, who's the head of the Air Force at the time. And Lanz overhears him and says, look, the best thing you can do is tell Fidel. He goes, look, I'm not crazy about everything that's happening right now. I don't like the fact that Che is involved in getting in there, and I don't like the communist infiltration. But at this point in time, uh, let's, let's try to deal with this on an upright basis. And Morgan agrees. And, and Morgan and, and um, Lazar Artola and and Manoel go to visit Fidel Castro at the Hilton, where Castro was staying in a $100 a night suite. And he goes up there, and he tells Fidel everything. This is what's going on. I want to just divulge to you what it is. And here's where Fidel's brilliance comes in, his Machiavellian brilliance, because he says, play double agent, pull them all out. 
And, and in time, that's exactly what he did. Now, you have to understand something. Rafael Trujillo was certainly no better than Batista, probably far worse. So Olga finds out that Morgan's now playing a double agent for the government against Ra And of course, she is not happy about this. But he says, look, if this gives us some protection, if this allows us to get some good graces for the, the current government, let's do it. What's it going to hurt? Let's go along with it. Let's do it. And they do. And Morgan plays this amazing role. He was not what you would call a kind of person to become a CIA type agent. He didn't. He was more of a soldier, but he plays the role. He now is both. He's juggling the CIA. He's juggling Castro on one side. He's got. He's dealing with the Trujillo people on the other. Now all of a sudden, the mob gets involved because they want to finance this whole thing, and it becomes a coup. They want Morgan to be the leader of a coup to take over, to kill Castro and take over the country. They eventually, and then we can just speed this ahead really quickly. Morgan does a brilliant job of playing the double agent. And in the, in the, in the end, they do smash the coup. They're able to keep Trujillo out. They're able to basically save the fledgling government from any kind of any intrusion that would ever face like that again. And at that point in time, the second front was okay. The problem comes in when Castro starts forging ties with the Soviets. And Morgan finds out at, at, at a certain point that um, they're bringing in Soviet military advisors. And, and all of a sudden, Castro is also establishing diplomatic ties with the Soviet Union. And Morgan, for all that he believed in, never believed, would never have gone along with communism. He was red, white, and blue to his core and wouldn't go along with it. And there was a moment in time when he confronts Fidel. Fidel is on the television, Telemundo, and he's going through one of his long 24-hour rants. And Morgan is seeing this on TV, and he's screaming, and Olga gets worried. She says, what's going on in there? He says, I'm going down to the television station. She says, you can't do that. That's Castro. He goes, I'm going down to the television station. He jumps in his blue Oldsmobile, the same one that had grenade launchers and everything inside. He, make, he, gets to the, he gets to the station. Olga is with all the escorts behind saying, William, be careful, be careful. He goes onto the stage, and of course, there's a huge applause for him. Comandante Morgan, the whole studio erupts, and they don't know what's going on. He walks right over to Castro. Nobody knows what they said to this day. Even Olga didn't actually hear him. But people watch Castro's body language, and he, he put his arms like this, and he was very upset. And all of a sudden, as Olga said, there were there was flames of hatred in his eyes, and I'll use the very words that she used. And as they walk, and then Morgan just wheeled around and walked out. Of course, everybody applauded because they're thinking there's Comandante Morgan talking to Comandante Castro. And Olga gets out and says, "We're done. We're done. That's it. <laughs> we're just. He's never going to forget this." And of course, Morgan didn't care. At this point in time, the United States government had stripped him of his citizenship because he had helped in the the coup. One thing we, we didn't cover was the interest of one particular person in his agency in the United States, and that was J. Edgar Hoover. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, just going back to Morgan quickly, and, and his, he used this, in playing this double agent, he really used his street smarts. Um, because when the United States is getting word that there's something up, there may be a coup that's underway, and that Morgan is somehow involved, now, Morgan has to keep flying back and forth to Miami to meet with Trujillo's people, to meet with the mob's people. And the FBI, you know, is, is going to be watching because they're getting the calls that, you know, from their informers that something's up. And so there were a couple of times that he was brought in by the FBI. And one time it was it all the guy leading the FBI investigation was a guy named Lehman Stafford, who was a pretty straight laced FBI agent. If you think of the Tom Hanks character in Catch Me As You Can, this, this was that guy. And um, he kept calling Morgan in and asking him questions. And um, Morgan was able to elude him. And, and even though he was being tailed by the FBI, was able to meet with all the figures he had to with the Trujillo people. And um, he was able to pull this off. And in fact, Morgan felt so bad about what he did. After, the, after the, they bust all of um, Trujillo's you know, men in this, in this failed coup, he calls up Lehman Stafford and says, look, I'm really sorry what I had to do, but if I told you the truth, 
I would have been arrested. It, it, the, with the juggling act that Morgan had to do, and remember, Castro puts them in a huge house. They're in this million-dollar house in Miramar, the Miramar neighborhood. And Olga now has to live in the same house with Castro's people are living there. Now you have Batista. That they, they, they send the Paticianos to live there, and everybody's playing their part. Nobody is knowing what the other side is doing. And Olga's in the middle of this, and she's pregnant at the time. And she's saying, my God, when am I, is my life ever going to return to normal? And several times she would say to William, William, let's go to America. Let's raise our kids there. Your mother's there. We can live in Miami. We can live in Ohio. But the one thing about Morgan is he'd never leave his, would he say, I can't leave my boys. He knew it would be open season on the other younger members of the second front if he left them. And he always felt this alliance. Even the FBI, when they start to put this amazing, they put this entire background work on him. They, one thing they said in there, I'll never forget it, they go, gets in trouble a lot, but he goes, but he's rem a remarkably loyal. To his, to his street buddies. He's remarkably loyal. And he was the same way in Cuba. But what you'll find with Morgan is he now has the woman that he loves. He now has a family. His, his first daughter is born. And he has a cause. And the cause is to protect and to give. And, and all along, they're, they're believing that someday Castro is going to do free elections. They're going to promise to finally come through with the free elections that they always said they would. But the one thing that happened to him that really bothered him was the stripping of his citizenship. That was hurtful. It was done by members of Congress because they wanted to support Trujillo. Trujillo was very much an anti-communist in the Caribbean, and they felt that they needed to support him. And so this is what Morgan was juggling during this entire period. In the end, Morgan decides that they have to go to war, that they have to raise an army in the Escambra. A couple things happen that lead to that. Two key members of the Second Front get arrested by Castro's people. One of them is Jesus Carrera. And Morgan said if they could arrest somebody like Jesus, who was a comandante, yes. who was one of the leaders of the Second Front and continues to be one of the leaders, they can arrest anyone. They can get any one of us. And when they did that, Morgan went to the brig where he was, it was a military brig in Santa Clara. He was able to pull Jesus out by saying, I'm a comandante, and he ordered them to release Jesus. And they all went off in a in a car together, and of course Morgan had said, this is under the orders of Fidel, he is to be released, and when they finally got to the car, he said, we never had anybody's orders, we gotta get out of here, and they both got in the car, and they all took off together. They realized then, though, there was gonna be problems, and they arrested Tony Chow, they arrested other members, and Morgan would always have to be putting fires out and getting them out. Castro had some allegiances to Morgan, but something happened during the press conference after the Trujillo conspiracy that bothered him to his dying day. And that was when Fidel takes out $78,000 that the, that the Batistianos had given towards the cause of unseating Castro. And he says, this is money that we were able to intercept. And he says, Comandante Morgan, I'm giving this to you as a reward. And Morgan looked and he says, and Olga was watching this on television at the time, and she says, don't take it, don't take it. But he says, why is he giving me this money? And he realized that this was one of a typical Castro thing that he would do when he was being upstaged. But Morgan at this point is an international figure. He's on the front page of the New York Times, the Washington Post. He's the double agent that saves the government, supposedly. And at this point in time, Castro had to take him down a notch by doing that, and that bothered him to his very day. So at this point in time, once the, the forces started aligning with the Soviet Union, Morgan realized we have to go to war. And so they started running guns into the Escambray Mountains, um, and eventually Morgan is arrested, um, and um, Olga is also put under house arrest during this period. And there's a great story about um, how Olga was able to, to free herself. And, and yeah, you know, she's under house arrest, and Morgan, you know, is, is, is in La, La Cabana, which is, of course, a notorious prison. And um, she just wants to see him. She wants to get, she, she believes that if she can somehow escape these guards, that so, she can end up seeing him. He, there's an escape plan, you know, for Morgan underway. They could all be reunited and fight the revolution in the Escambray. And so it's New Year's Eve, and um, Olga, is, there are four guards in the house, and she didn't like the guards at all. They were, they were mistreating her. And then New Year's Eve, what she decided to do was she was going to offer them hot cocoa. 
And so she, was, she took sleeping medicine and she ground it into the cocoa and then she offered them the cocoa and of course when they drank it, they passed out. And once she they passed out, she girl. grabbed her two little girls, left, and she really didn't have any idea where she was gonna go. She, would, she walks out into the street and she knew she was free, but where? And so there were a bunch of safe houses that had been set up by, by the Second Front and, and the other you know, anti-Castro um, forces. And so she was moving with her two young daughters, one, one and, and two years old, from safe house to safe house to safe house. And, to, and, and eventually, Olga, she gets, um, she's at the home of Enrique Ancinoza, who was 11 years old, and his father <laughs> at the time. And Enrique still remembers to this day the, the image of this woman in the hall. He's, he was laying on his bed reading, and he looked up and he saw this woman in the hall with her daughter at his side. And he never forgot that. And his father, he remembers his father going in and says, don't say anything. Don't even tell your grandmother, your aunts, no one. Don't say anything. And Enrique kept his word. He would not say anything. And the next morning, Enrique's father took Olga out, and they got her in a cab, and they took her. And Olga, at that point, got... And Enrique's father made sure that the Venezuelan embassy would take her. Unfortunately, the cabbie took her to the Brazilian embassy. So Olga gets out with her two dollars. She's sitting. She says, "Oh my God, this is the wrong embassy." But she can't run. By the now, the cab's gone. There's no way she can run to the other embassy in time. So she runs up and says, "Please tell the ambassador I'm here. I'm the seamstress for his wife, and I'm here." And of course, they start making calls. And then Olga tells one of her daughters, "Run into the garden, and I'll follow you." Olga was smart. She knew. She was always a step ahead. And so the, her little daughter, Loretta, runs into the garden. Olga runs after her with the, her other little baby in the arms, Olgita. And the gardener comes out, and Olga, he could tell that Olga needed help. He goes, come on, come with me right now. And they pull her into the house, and she stays, and they give her asylum inside the Brazilian embassy, the Brazilian ambassador and his wife. Who, and they actually took Olga, not into the embassy. They let her stay in their own home with her two daughters with them. William at that time is in La Cabana. There are plans to escape, but it never really turns out that way. And um, um, she, at one point, gets goes um, when she was, and I, I did skip ahead. She she did see him for a brief moment when they brought her in for her court appearance in there, and she and she saw he was emaciated. They had been putting glass in his food and other things, and he had been getting sick in there, and she could tell. And she was, it was one of the last times she saw him. And she hugged him and kissed him and said, I love you. He said, I love you back. And she would never see him again. And um, at that point in time, um, a lot of events took place. But things were bearing down. They were getting word that there was going to be some sort of an invasion. Not that long, not that far away. And um, Hiram Gonzalez remembers when they get the call late at night, when they would come through and they would announce the names of the people who would be appearing for their trials. And um, um, William Morgan got the call. They, they gave his name, and, and he and Jesus Carrera were both led down from different galerias, I believe, or they may have been in the same one, I'm not positive, the same one. But they both went down together, and they would wait their time and wait for their trial. And um, um, there were no trials then. I mean, they, they, there was a foregone conclusion. This is what's going to happen to us. One of the great things that for us, in the course of pulling together documents and research, we were able to get tr trial records. They weren't really transcripts, but they were records of the sitting judges, who they were. Uh, I use the judge, the, the term judge loosely. They had no legal education, but they were there for one purpose, to convict, basically, people. There was a, and, and they, they were, they were, William was, was defended by a Luis Caro, who was basically the attorney for the damned. And he tried day after day to try to save a lot of these young men from going to the wall, but it was almost impossible. And um, the one thing that struck us in the course of time is Morgan started to, like when he did get well, he started to do push-ups and sit-ups and started running around the prison yard. I mean, even the guards were calling him El Loco. He was just, and, and they would see him up in his bunk praying in the afternoons after working out and training. It was almost as if he was training for his final hours, you know, in, in many ways. And um, um, there's not a lot, there's a few people that remembered. We were fortunate to get tapes of tape recorded interviews with um, Pedro Osorio Franco and with Edmundo Amado. 
And they gave great detail about some of those final, some of what was going on in prison during that period, during that time. Hiram Gonzalez helped to some extent to piece together the bits and pieces of those, those last few months. But by the time that Jesus and William appeared at the trial, it was basically a foregone conclusion. And the interesting thing about it is when you talk to people that were with both men, and, and particularly with Henry Raymond had been in William's cell with him, he said there wasn't an ounce of fear. There was nothing. He knew he was going to die. He was prepared for it. There was no fear whatsoever. And I understand it was the same thing with Jesus. There was just, both of these men were just calm. They were just sublime. They knew it was going to happen to them. And there was absolutely no fear in it. If anything, they were going to go to the wall dying as men. They were not going to whimper. They were not going to cry. They were, there was nothing, no sign of that in either one of those men. And um, they, um, um, we were able to get a letter that the priest, Juan McNiff, had written. Um, he had heard um, Morgan's last confession. I believe another priest had heard Jesus's. And then, of course, they were both killed at the wall. Morgan's final letter, and I have a letter that he wrote to Olga. And this is just before, they, they had already been convicted at, their, at their, their trial. And he said that, you know, he says, you know, to Olga, I'm writing this letter in English because it's easier to express myself in this language. To tell you that I love you, it's not sufficient because words could never express my feelings towards you or what you mean to me. Since the first time I saw you in the mountains until the last time I saw you in prison, you have been my love, my happiness, my companion in life, and in my thoughts during my moment of death. Such a little time we had to spend together, you, the girls, and myself. It always seems that we could never be alone. The moments that we were able to, we had to steal them. But each of those moments I now remember with happiness. You are the mother of my daughters, and I ask you to keep them safe and sound. And this I know you will do, because you are a good wife and a good mother. Do not be sad, because we are not together, because this moment, because it is the way that I wanted it, and because I know that you are safe. I have great peace in my spirit. I want you to know that I do not fear death. I go to its encounter, not like towards an enemy, but like towards a friend. I say this knowing that we are innocent of the things that we are accused of, Olga. I have never been a traitor, or have I done any damage to Cuba. I tell you this because you know this is the truth. Although between you and I, words are not necessary, because sometimes they think that you know more than anyone, and you even know what I am thinking. Dear, as a writer of love letters, I am not so good. The words on paper can never describe the feelings that I have towards you or the love that we have shared. When I found you, I found everything that I wished for in the world, and only death can separate us. I leave you to care for Loretta and Olguita, asking you to educate them in the same way as you are. Let them know someday who their father was and what my beliefs and ideals were. But for doing this, you must wait until they are old enough to understand this. I ask you to please never allow that my name, the girls are yours, get utilized for political reasons for those who would use them for hatred, wrongs, or to attack Cuba or its people, or to re represent the things which I could never represent. With our lawyer, I leave you a will, leaving you everything I own in the world, my ideals and beliefs you share with me, and you know more than anyone in what I would do at any moment, and I know that I can trust you to defend these ideals. On the other hand, I want you to know that I do not have any rancor towards those who accuse us, those who judge us, repeated towards those who accuse us unjustly. Manolito and Ruben will receive justice because before God, and God will take care of them. I do not want blood spilled over my cause. They are young and they will have to fight with their own consciences and do not know what they are doing. Those who are putting us on trial and condemning us have their own job to do and are acting according to the conditions set out by today's politics. So if they are guilty of so many injustices, leave it to history to straighten out such faults. Revenge is not the answer. It's better that I die because I have defended lives. I only ask that someday the truth will be known and that my daughters will be proud of their father. I have written to my mother and I have asked that all of you take care of each other. Okay, my love. I've had so many beautiful plans, you and I, going to the mountains with the girls and living with peace and tranquility. I'm writing this letter before the sentencing at 9.45 a.m., knowing for sure what the results will be. But I will finish this before I leave, so at least I know that this will reach the end. The sentencing will be at 2 p.m. We will know the results at night. I'm very sure that you will see that, dear, your loving husband, William. 
So it's these kinds of letters that inspired us, the letters he wrote to his mother, the letters he wrote to his children. There's a brief little letter that he wrote to his mom from the mountains during the revolution. He says, Mom, this will be the first letter I've written to you since I left in December. I know that neither you approve or understand why I'm here, even though you are the one person in the world that I believe understands me. I've been many places in my life and done many things which you did not approve or understand, nor did I understand myself at the time. I do not expect you to prove, but I believe you will understand. And if it should happen that I am killed here, you will know that it was not for foolish fa fancy, or as dad would say, a pipe dream. And he went on to describe what he had witnessed, the atrocities against some of the villagers by Batista's soldiers. And he says, I'm here with men and boys who fight for freedom for their country, just as we as Americans, that, that, we, that we as Americans take for granted. They neither fight for money or fame, only to return to their homes in peace. And then to his little daughter, he wrote this. He says, when I last saw you, where you were a little tyke who was, everything at all the t who was everywhere all the time. You used to sit in the window, and when you saw my car drive, you'd say, Daddy, Daddy. I think those were the first words you spoke. And I know when I did not come home anymore, I know you missed me. I looked out the window for your dad. This was a long time ago, baby. And possibly you don't remember me, but I do and always will. You were going to grow up to be a beautiful girl with a fine disposition. Stick close to your mom. I don't think anyone can find anyone better. And then to his son. These are the two children he had before he left. These are the letters he wrote them. Love your country, love your God, and stand up for both. I can say very little to you except this, Bill, and I think it's the best advice I can give you. Always be a man. Defend your rights. Respect the rights of others. Listen to what your mother tells you. You may not like what she tells you, but believe she is right. Study and work hard, son, and I know that your country and your mother will always be proud of you. Love always your dad. The little boy would never get that letter. He died when he was six years old, a blunt trauma by the stepfather. But, but she would get that letter someday and be inspired by her father. And Olga knows, knows the history of that. And so, um, you know, I can only tell you that, that Olga's life after this, she spent nearly 11 years in Castro's prisons. Um, a lot of things, she was beaten, she lived in, she was in solitary during most of those periods. Um, and she never forgot the very words that William had told her, if you ever get out, I want you to go to Ohio, my mother will take care of you. And when Olga did get out, she couldn't leave right away, she lived in a convent with nuns, she couldn't really go to Santa Clara, because every time she went there, the G2 would show up, and they would hassle her and her family. So she stayed most of the time in Havana with these nuns. But when she had a, plans, a chance to go to the Peruvian embassy um, in 1980, she did. And then when she had a chance to finally leave on the Mario boat lift, she did. She didn't get this letter until after she was out of prison. So it was 11 years before she finally got the letter that, her, that William had written her. And when she finally went to his grave in La, the Cologne Cemetery, and she saw it for the first time, and the grave, the, the grave tender even said, look, I could be, I could be losing my life for that, doing this, but I'm going to show you. And she went there. She realized she needed to get out. And so on a rickety boat, when the last boat that left the harbor, Olga was put on it. And, of course, the Cuban Navy shot holes into the hull as it was leaving, so it leaked all the way and eventually made it to Key West. It couldn't get as far as Miami, but it went to Key West. Olga got out. She didn't stay in Miami like most of her relatives she ended up going to, um, going to Toledo. And, and through one of William's friends that they knew from Havana, he gave her a ticket. She ended up up there, and she met Loretta, Morgan, Morgan's mother, for the first time. And um, they became very close. And again, they talked. The, Morgan's mother left her with one thing. If you can ever do one thing, restore William's citizenship and bring his body back. And Olga was left with this legacy to try to carry out. And in 2007, Olga was successful. She was able to get William Morgan's citizenship restored po posthumously through the help of her attorney, um, um, O.B. Rollison. And the State Department rescinded it and said this should never have been done to begin with. He didn't do anything to lose his citizenship. And now the real quest is on to try to return the remains, and Mitch can bring you up to date on where that is right now. Yeah, they're negotiating right now. Um, they, um, the Pope has gotten involved with it, and um, now that relations look like they're thawing with, with Cuba, it looks like this is gonna happen. Well, we hope, we hope so. We, hope we so. can only hope, hope someday that, that yeah. William is reinterred here and, and back here. And so, 
This story, when you think of William Morgan, you think, and we talked about very early on, of this never do well, and he struggled, and he struggled to find his moral center. But in Cuba, he finds his love, he finds his cause, and really in his death, he found his redemption. And when you read those final letters, especially the one he wrote to his mother, he said, I made my peace with God, and now whatever happens to me, happens to me. And so this, this story that we, um, we kept around for 12 years has finally, <laughs> finally been written. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you.